My name is Stephen King. Spend some time in the dark. Please don't let me in the dark. I'm gonna scare the hell out of you. And that's a promise. And welcome to Castle Rag Radio. I am Max Booth. And I am Lori Michelle. And this is the Stephen King Podcast, a program where we talk about Stephen King. Man, the, I'm in the wrong place. Oh, this isn't the Dean Koontz cast. Damn! My what guess is episode's done. <laughs> and that's the end. Got the wrong guest on. Oh, man. <laughs> now, today we'll be talking about the, the Shining, kind of. Sort of. Um, if you'll just now tune me in for the first time... We are a podcast where we pick something King has written or he's somehow involved in. We kind of walk through the plot and we uh, we have some fun with it. We like to make fun a lot. We have a joyous time. Ooh. We get all nickels in a twist. <laughs> I don't know. We have all people bell even... bottoms dusted. I don't even know if people wear knickers anymore, do they? I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that just a cinnamon for um, animal garments? I don't know. No, they were like a specific kind of undergarment. I, don't know. I wasn't around then. Nobody was around then. <laughs> Nobody was around. That's why no one bought them. They, they had no custom molds. They were all twisted. So um, if you listened to the last episode, we promised a new episode this week about The Shining. Well, before we get to The Shining, we're going to give you an episode about the long lost prologue to The Shining titled Before the Play. Yeah. It was um, originally cut from the manuscript because the editor or publisher, whoever was, whoever makes those decisions, in charge of those things. he wanted to save a buck or two. He th- it would be cheaper to print the, the novel with these like 50 pages cut from the beginning. Which is. A reasonable expectation. Books still not cheap to print. They are not cheap to print. For oh. those of you who think that they are, you are wrong. For those just tuning in, we also operate a small publishing company called Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Go buy all books. Yeah, but it really is amazing how much like 50 pages does make in the difference of printing. It, it really does jump the price up for printing it. Yeah, um, and I would say this was one of the most intelligent decisions that they could have made. I agree. I mean, just content-wise, while I thought this prologue is pretty cool, it would have definitely seemed like a slog getting through. Well, yeah, and it really would have screwed up the rest of the book, I think. Yeah, so this is, this this, um, this lost prologue is basically, we just, we'll jump in the round through history of the Overlook Hotel, just talking about some spooky things that have happened. Right, and it was definitely very cool. Yeah. But it really would have messed up with the actual And plus, actual most book. of these um, incidents, all I'm um, hinted at or referenced throughout the actual novel, right. we just get them in little detail. Right. And um, this prologue. And yeah, it wouldn't have been great to have inside the actual book, but it's cool just to look at and be like, ah, this is a neat special feature. Right. Like I was saying before we got on the show, um, It'd be awesome if he had if he could expand this into like a coffee table book, like the history of the Overlook. Right, that that would be cool. Can you imagine having the history of the Overlook Hotel on your coffee table? No. Do people actually have books on their coffee tables no one anymore? Does. <laughs> well, we do, but we have like twelve books on uh, our. We do have table. a coffee table book about <laughs> coffee tables. Okay, Kramer. <laughs> so this book came out in nineteen seventy seven. Right. And. Uh, this prologue was re was well not reprinted. It was printed in Whispels Magazine, Volume Five, Number One through t- Two. <laughs> one dash two. One. I don't know what that what kind of numbering system August they got. August nineteen eighty two. They got some sort of weird ass numbering system um, going on there. But after that, it, he claimed it was lost. Sure. Which was a lie because it was then in nineteen ninety seven reprinted. And TV Guide, of all places, to yeah, well, promote Mick Gillis's miniseries. TV Guide used to be like a wealth of knowledge in terms of, like, history yeah, of things and was TV interviews. Wikipedia before Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you used it to buy IBDM. TV Guide. 
Because you got a TV guide in your newspaper for free, but then you actually bought TV guide for all the other crap that you used to get. In. Yeah, well, TV guide. They have to probably, probably still make TV guides. I think they do, but I I seriously doubt it's got the same pull it used to. I, I thought it's probably like a TV guide.com with all types of juicy content. Could be. That all lead to virus, viruses. <laughs> <click> probably. <laughs> I mean, who's going to tvguide.com? Old people, probably. And they all easily exposed to viruses. Well, I know, like, here... Co- I mean that as, like, you don't have viruses. <laughs> not, not so physical, <laughs> physical viruses. viruses. They have weak immune systems. I know here, right before my grandma passed here a couple years ago, that my dad found out she was still being charged for a TV guide. What? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know was if she, she was... getting them? I don't know if she was physically still getting them or if they were scamming her or oh, what. Man. TV guide... Bunch of crooks. Yeah, exactly. So, um, besides being reprinted in the TV guide, it was also printed in um, a new edition of The Shining released by Cemetery Dance just two years ago, I think it was. I don't have the notes written down. Um, but it's already sold out, so I mean, don't go, you're not going to find it now. Right. But uh, they have the complete prologue and all the epilogue because there's also an epilogue called after the play which was heavily condensed into the final novel Mm -hmm. but evidently used to be a lot longer and in this collected limited edition the um, original version was included Hmm. same with the original after before the play gotcha because if you notice and the TV guide, not all of the prologue is included. It's been edited and lots of scenes all omitted. Because um, the prologue is split into uh, five scenes. Right. And then the TV guide, like scene one is missing, scene three is missing. Uh. Because it's a, it's a public book, you know? I mean, they wanted to um, avoid some of the particular nastiness from the right. prologue. So they just cut it. But we found the original prologue off a website we'll not get a link because it's illegal. But we have it. <laughs> and we read it. And it was like, what, 50 pages? Something like that? I, it, I don't know. It's hard to tell on the internet. I gotta say, the TV Guide thing, looking through it, it's pretty fucking funny. It's just fun to look at. We'll link some guy he, uh, who has a copy of the TV Guide. He has a blog post. This is a different one than the one where we read the original prologue. Right. But the Zezel dude, a woman, I don't know. It could be Person. anyone. Of interest. <laughs> uh, he, she, they they uploaded the, the scanned copies of the TV guide and you can flip through all the pages. So if you want to read a, a condensed version of the prologue, we will be linking that in the show notes. But just looking through the, the this TV guide, I th- it's funny just how cheesy some of it is. Some of the advertisements, like those, there's one page called, it's an advertisement. It's like, welcome to the Overlook. If you need anything, just scream. And it's spelling out red rum, and each um, level has a different, like, what? Trivia Person, facts? Yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's just pretty cool, I thought. Like, those, yeah, it's like, it's listing through the, the cast and the kill tools. Like, the Tillens family has a rough rental at the <coughs> Overlook. Daddy's on the wagon. The meat wagon. What does that mean? Yeah. I, what um, is a meat wagon? I, 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 yeah, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> the fuck is a meat wagon? Uh, um. Mommy's really sick about her son, Danny, who's had, who's had prone to seizures. Well, psychic. If he is psychic... The full cast is a bloody mess. Dun, dun, dun. Each section has a cheesy <laughs> right section. Each section has a cheesy section. Each section <laughs> has a cheesy um, just description. Right. But what is a meat wagon? I don't. I don't know. But yeah, every one of these little <laughs> snippets ends with like one of those stupid, but then, dumbass, uh, twisted but, lines. But then at the end, we have a new cast Ooh. member, Grim Reaper. We'll be making a specific appeal, a special appearance at the Overlook tonight. He does a lot of work there. <laughs> oh, 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 pro bono. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that's pretty cool and fun. Um, also, like, the front cover of the TV guide is, like, this snowy illustration of the Overlook Hotel. Right. But um, TV guide didn't have a lot of faith in uh, people, wa- like, being interested in it. So only a select few had that specific cover. 
that specific Kevl in the other editions, they opted for a more safe face, Thomas Hanks. Good old Thomas. Because Phil Scott was debuting on TV that week. Right. He also had some other special going on. I he didn't was look like, too much into yeah, it. it was very. He was very popular. It was a at week of Thomas Hanks. Right. But what I found interesting because when I was reading that um, blog bloggers yeah, yeah. post was the fact that this is the only miniseries that ABC did that didn't go immediately into VHS production. Wow. I mean, it's finally made its way to DVD, but it took a long time for it to get there. I can't say I've seen the miniseries. Have you? I, at the time, I was still work. Well, I still do work nights. I mean, evenings. So, no, I didn't because that was really before Why people... Why didn't you just record it on DVR? Yeah, I think that was before DVR. <laughs> I'm, well, we might have had DVR back then. I don't remember. But no, I have not seen it. Hmm. I understand it's excellently done. I just have not seen it. Yeah, well, I guess one day we'll have to watch it. One day, if we can find it. <laughs> I'm sure you can easily buy the DVD copy on Amazon or any of the other websites you can buy yeah, DVDs. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we get into the actual... Um, before the play, a couple of years ago, there was announced a prequel movie or TV show called The Overlook Hotel. It was going to be directed by Mark Romanek, and it was also going to be written by James Vanderbilt, who wrote Zodiac. Hmm. It was going to be a prequel, but there was never a lot of details about it, except that it wouldn't be about the Tullens family, it would be about the people who uh, made the hotel. I mean, think about how cool that could be as a series. Yeah, it'd be like the Bates Motel or something, yeah. which I think sucks, so... <laughs> That's the best uh, example. Well, I just, I mean, you, it could be anth- antho- anthologetic. <laughs> Is that a word? I mean, maybe that's what we're going to get with this um, season two of Castle Rock. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, just think about it. I mean, every day it could be a different week at the hotel with a different guest and, and would, different weirdness. And I would write it. And Max would write it and he'd be the night auditor. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'd be awesome. Um, I mean, I don't know how much this prologue had to do with the potential adaptation, but... There hasn't been any news about it since 2015, so it's probably it's dead. probably dead, but... But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a rational assumption that it was going to be an, an adaptation that we fill the play. Right. But I guess we don't know. Netflix, Hulu, are you listening? Full not. Damn. Only like eight people are listening. <laughs> Thomas Joyce, animal, make this. <laughs> yeah, Thomas Joyce, Thomas Hanks, any one of you. Somebody, go make this. Okay, so... Be sure to play. Like we said, it's split into five sections. Right. And we begin um, at the end of the season of October 22nd, 1922. Right. The, um, the, a man who used to own it, Bob T. Watson, is kind of just like looking out the window thinking, ah, another season passed. Yeah. Ha ha. Ha ha. But two new brothers have just recently purchased the hotel. Yeah, Clyde and Cecil Brandywine. Right. Who, uh, they're rich from cattle and oil money because they're from Texas, and that's how everybody gets rich in Texas. Yeah, which is why we're poor, because we have no oil or cattle. Have you tried poking the backyard? No, because we live in South Texas and there's no oil here. Have you ever seen any movies? <laughs> in movies, they always just take a big knife or a pole. Yeah. And they like look smugly at the audience watching them, and then without even looking at the ground, they just spill it into the ground and oil pops and out it right? pops out and they smile like haha i knew this would happen and now i'm rich what are you no. gonna do about it in our backyard if we dug down we would just hit rock yeah a massive collection of file ants that probably too all that body um <laughs> <laughs> but before they bought before them clyde and cecil brandywine bought it uh before that since 1915 the hotel has been owned by a man named john pillis right who is like this common crook he get somehow he got rich off of his best friend's wealth because his friend owned the railroad company yeah well i think well, he's what's going on with i that? think he was skimming off the railroad and collecting it for himself i see i see I wasn't sure if he was just bummy money. I'm like, hey, I'm your friend. You have to pay me no, money. No, somehow he was... I wish we had a rich friend. I wish we had a rich friend, too. Oh, well. Sadly. Do we know anyone who was a president of a railroad company? Does anybody actually own any railroads? No, God owns those. <laughs> anyway, uh, John Pillis, he uh, dropped dead of a health attack while strolling the ground. So right. now Clyde and Cecil have bought it. 
but uh, the the owner will be filled, John. Bob T. Watson. He had sold it to John. Ah, I misread all that. That's okay. But be, but back before Clyde and Cecil, and back before John Pillars, because you know this is a Stephen King novel, because we keep jumping back and forth. Exactly. We begin at a you present go, time. Yes. You have to look back to the past. It's just the way that Stephen King works. So but the man that's telling this about these people is Bob T. Watson. Bob who, Twatson. Bob Twatson. <laughs> <laughs> He's basically the self-made man. He. Um, he had a rich family, but then they they went broke, and then he made the fortune himself by. I mean, what was he doing? How did he get uh, rich? Uh, silver, silver, something, something. But he at one point he I don't know what this means. He bought himself a governor. In other words, he was a lobbyist. I see. So the governor would vote. If for I didn't know anything from watching Veep, that's illegal. <laughs> yes, it is, but people do it anyway. But, you know, that way they would vote for things in his favor. I see. So, Swatson, he had decided in a, he wanted to have, like, the greatest hotel in America. Right. He, um, to quote the book, it would stand at the roof of America with nothing in the country at a high altitude except the sky. It would be a playground of the national and international rich. The people that would be known three generations later as the super rich. And if that doesn't make you want to vomit, I don't know what does. I mean, I love this plan because it would be great if we could get the super rich of the country all in one place. And blow it up. And just blow it the fuck up. Yes. So, I mean, Twatson, he has a great idea. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't go, doesn't go exactly as he plans. Construction begins in 1907 when Bob is only 43 years old. So, I mean, this is 1907. He's on his deathbed at this point. Probably. No one lived past, past 29. <laughs> He's, uh, it's 40 miles west of Sidewindle. Side Sidewindle. Sidewindle, Sidewindle Now, is this a fictional town? You know, I don't know. Probably. I didn't look it up. It's in the Phil's Colorado. Yes. But by the time this construction be, um, ends, t- only two years later, Bob is bald. Right. And to quote the prologue, he had developed and also one of his two sons, the one he had loved best. Well, fuck the other one. How did they know that? Like, do you think yeah. he would tell them? Like, oh, boy, well, I But you know what? It most. is telling it from his point of view. So, yeah. I mean, he is. I know, the, but it's funny. Yeah. The one he had loved most, best, the one that had been de- First of all, it's the one who had been destined. Not that, Stephen King. Yeah. I thought you taught English, you fool. The one that had been destined to kill you, the, wa- the twats and banal, <laughs> fooled into the future, had died in a stupid riding accident. Boyd had tried to jump his pony over a pile of lumber, and the pony had caught its back feet and broken its leg. Boyd had broken his neck. Nice. Which is hilarious. I mean, we have to assume the son is what, at least a teen? I would assume he's probably maybe in his twenties. Yeah, like around late teenagerhood or early adulthood. This kid is a fucking moron. Right? Why does he jump on his he, horse over I a mean, pile of lumber anyway? It's nineteen oh seven. I can I, I can handle. I mean, was he's like the original Johnny Knoxville? I, probably. Was he doing some jackass stunts <laughs> for MTV? What was MTV in nineteen oh seven? Just M. M. So all they had was music. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, like, I wouldn't even tell anyone that's how my son died. Yeah, right. he tried to jump a wall with a pony. Right. I mean, I can, un- bill I can understand him riding a horse, and I can understand him jumping his horse over stuff, but not over a pile of lumber that's sitting there. <laughs> it's how like, did he dar- get the pony to do that? I guess I ponies know. are pretty fucking stupid. I mean, just be like, no, man, I'm not going to do that. Well, you know, that happens. Yeah. And then they throw the rider. <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh, son's dead now because he's a moron. Uh, he began to lose money around this time due to a dishonest accountant costing him a couple million. What was right. going on? Though? So if his account was he was, skimming, he was skimming. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, but the accountant did go to prison for a time that I forget. Twenty years. He <laughs> yields. Yes. That's outrageous. Well, they, like he says, he went to. Jail for twenty years, but I still lost that five mil. So what difference does it make? It's a man's life. I, yeah, I don't think anyone goes to prison for twenty yields. I don't for know doing that. 
My God, you could be a cop and shoot an innocent black kid and do no jail time. <laughs> but you just skin from the rich, and man. 20 years? 20, your life is gone. Pretty How much time do you think outrageous. he actually served? Uh, probably a lot. I don't know. When you, you can't fuck over the rich, man. They, they. This is true. The system is built to punish those who uh, do not have money. This is very true. Bob, at this time, also became convinced that he could save this uh, loss, of, loss of fortune with Silville, despite right. what everybody told him. They were all like, no, Bob, that's stupid. Don't right, do don't prospect Silver. That's over and done with, dude. It's 1907. <laughs> right, it's Cut not 1807. <laughs> invest in stocks. Mm. I don't know if stocks were around. I'm sure they were. Probably. But uh, he did not see the way after he lost $1 million, but he did see what they will say. And after he lost $2 million, he decided, yeah, okay, you might have a point. If I lost like 100 bucks, I'd be like, okay, okay I'm done. If I lost 10 bucks, I'd be pissed. <laughs> That's taco money. Exactly. But the hotel, the Overlook Hotel, which is, which is called, what, the Stanley Hotel in real life? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. We'll get into that in the next episode. Anyway, so the hotel, the Overlook Hotel, is officially open June 1, 1910. Right, and it opened later than what he wanted because that year they had torrential rains making all the roads to the hotel like nothing but mud. Yeah, it's a 60-mile stretch of road from the main highway to right. the hotel, which and is outrageous. That's a really long it's way. It's a long drive. Shut that even now in a good car, that'll take you an hour. Can you imagine back then? It would take in like two or three. Ah, uh, pony too. Hey. Uh, but, uh, during the ribbon cutting ceremony, a woman faints because she sees something in the window that doesn't look quite like a man. Ooh. But what does it look like? Look like? A um, woman? A dog? A dog man? Ooh. Also on this day, which I will again quote from the prologue actually you can quote it I'm okay sick of quoting things. one of the two chefs has scalded his arm while preparing lunch and had to be taken to the hospital closest by far away in boulder mrs arkenbauer the wife of the meatpacking king <laughs> <laughs> there's the meatpacking that's what i was called in high school the king. had slipped while the meat packing <laughs> king fell off the meat wagon today yes <laughs> had slipped while toweling herself dry after a bath and broken her wrist and finally the crowning touch at dinner that night Bob T's pet congressman swallowed a piece of heavy western sirloin strip steak the wrong way and choked to death in the full and horrified view of 200 guests, nearly all of them there at Bob T. Watson's personal invitation. Yeah, and one of the guests, who was like a med student, he uh, performs an emergency tracheotomy on him, which is pretty amusing to me, just imagining this guy <laughs> running up and stabbing him in the throat. I don't know how they'll actually perform but in my head, I just pitchel someone running up with like a pen and just shaking them in the throat yeah i'm not sure exactly how it works either but it's probably yeah. close enough i would love to do that to someone would you no i mean i just i think about it a lot <laughs> it's your fantasy and after all this there was a line that is really vague he says the man was dead and before the end of the week, half the guests had departed. Is he saying they checked out, or is he saying they died? Well, they checked out could be either way. <laughs> you know. No, I means. think he means they left. Well, I mean, I don't know. This is a montage of spooky incidents. Yeah, I so, think I mean, he they meant they died. Met. Anyway, then Bob's wife dies from influenza. Right. Well, she was a non-kill till anyway. Well, she kept nagging him. Yeah, don't just lose a all this Stephen money. King why don't nag you? Wife. Well, she kept telling him, "Why don't you give up this dream? It's killing you. You're losing everything." Blah and blah blah. Bob's like, "Shut up, woman. You know I have a say in my life. Just do what I say. I'm Bob T. Watson." But then he has to repave the last six, the last fuck. But then he has to repave the last sixty miles of road leaving to the hotel yeah. because the um just holes have begun to conjure. Well, the weather was so bad that it was screwed up the road, so he had to repave it. And he's like, well, his accountant is like, he got screwed by the guy who paved it. But Bob, like, he witnessed the dude pave it. He did right. a good job, but now the guy who paved it is nowhere to be found. Spooky enough. Right. What could have happened to him? But he's like kind of perturbed because he's like, I watched him. How could he have screwed me over? Right. Maybe the hotel is haunted. Doo-doo. 
Uh, and then his accountant comes up to him. He's like, you, you need to go file for bankruptcy immediately. Right. You hold $200,000 in debt. And Bob just looks at him and goes, that's ridiculous. Get out of here. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's just an amusing response. It is. It was kind of funny that but he... No, I'm not. He fired his accountant for telling him he was in, in debt. <laughs> it's like, well, that's the accountant. I'm rebel. I'm, you'll glue anything you say bounces out for right. me and six to you. Now you're in debt. <laughs> but the accountant kept telling him, look, dude, we don't have any money, you know? You but don't have anything. He soon uh, realizes that the accountant was being honest with them, and he, sell, he tries to sell it, but he's in debt. So he right. has to do all these odd jobs and beg people to... He sells Wipe off a, the yeah. debt clean so he can sell it on the cheap. Right. He he keeps it open long enough to sell it rather than it being taken over. At one point, he blackmails a newspaper publisher who's also diddling kids. <laughs> yeah, something <laughs> like that. Was <laughs> Whoa, he needed to tell someone about that. Also, how do you know? <laughs> right. But he sold off whatever else he had that he possibly could to keep the bank from taking the hotel. And then he sold the actual property to um, John Pillis, who right. was in the beginning of this scene, for extremely cheap on the condition that him and his son could be custodians at the hotel and live right. on, pr- on the property. But I, all of a sudden I went, aha, that's who Dick Watson is. Cause that's the dick I know. That is the dick I know. <laughs> I recognize that dick from anywhere. <laughs> And then we go to scene two, a bedroom in the wee hours of the morning. Mm. And this is when um, the TV guide version begins. I don't know why they cut the film. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because it was like a logical history of the hotel. It's just odd the beginning of scene two because it's just this this newlywed woman, um, Lottie Kilgallen. Kilgallen? Kilgallen. It's, 19, it's August 1929. She's laying in bed, honeymooning at the Overlook with a fat, rich husband, William P- Pillsbury. I know, and they never say, I mean, they say he's wealthy from this, that, and the other, but I wanted to know if they owned a baking empire. They don't. I know, it's sad. They might. I don't know. It's like he's not rich, but his dad's rich. Right, his family is rich. Yeah, and she fucking hates this dude so much. It's obvious from the beginning. Oh, yeah. She's just million for the money. That money, money, money. And you know what? Good for you. I would do the same. That's why you're here. <laughs> I said I would. I haven't had oh, the okay. opportunity. Excuse me. I, uh, when I came here, I was under the assumption that you had lots of money. You were wrong. <laughs> I, I, I just got all this. <laughs> The only reason the um, honeymooning in the Overlook is because the husband wanted to go to Rome and she wanted to do uh, anything he didn't want to do. She right. wants to see what she can get away with. Yeah, she wants to see how far she can go before he puts his foot down. Which is fucking crazy. <laughs> Which is, yeah, it's kind of funny. But the thing is, is he'll agree to do anything she says just because. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But she doesn't really like the overlook, so she's gonna. She's planning on just not making them stay much longer. All they originally had planned to stay for three weeks. Who honeymoons for three weeks? People who are rich. Oh man, get them all in that hotel. Fucking blow it up. <laughs> but she's only gonna make them stay for five more days or so because she's been having bad spooky dreams. Mm. And then they could go back to New York. And plus, she's all excited because right now the the stock market is going crazy because it's August 1929 and the sky's the limit and everything's looking up for the old stock market. Right. What, what could go wrong? Right. Nothing. I mean, we all know from history, 1929 it was a great year for the stock market. People made so Come much on. money. Nothing's going to go wrong. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she's having bad dreams. She, uh, she's playing bridge with her husband, but she's all irritated. She begins screaming at him for doing the wrong play. Right, for not anticipating the fact that she had spades. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, I don't play bridge, so I really have no Honestly, idea. Honestly, this whole section could be cut and I'd be fine. Yeah. But um, they eventually leave the hotel. Um, the husband's dad dies of a heart attack two weeks later after... <gasps> Surprise, the stock market crashes. (gasps) What? And they can't keep the company, so things just go from shit to extra shit. Extra shit? uh, What's Wilson's shit? Um, uh, Baby shit, maybe. Oh, maybe. So, yeah, things just go bad. She uh, she commits suicide in the motel room in 1949, so it's been 20 years old. I can do math. She's still thinking, basically, about... This night at the Overlook Hotel, while she's laying in bed, and this 
ghost hand grabbed all. Right. And it spooked all. She it reached si- out from under the bed and grabbed her. So she commits suicide thinking about this ghost hand. Uh, she's in a holiday inn. And she leaves a one-note sent suicide note that says, I wish we had gone to Rome. Right, which is where her husband had wanted to go. Right, instead of the Overlook Hotel. Do you think the Overlook Hotel caused the stock not st- uh, the Great Depression? I'm going to say yes. Okay, so scene three is on the night of the Grand Masquerade. So now we're in 1946. Yes. Um, who owns it? Horace Derwent now owns the hotel. Who is this? I don't know who he is. Some rich creep. Right. He's throwing this giant eyes wide shut penalty. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> yeah, basically it's, it's a big ass orgy. So this guy named Lewis Toner, at Horace's request, is dressed like a dog. Which, if you've seen the movie The Shiny, is one of the most iconic scenes in the whole fucking film. It's Dog it's Man. It's Dog Man performing fellatio on this man in the business suit. I mean, this is him. This is Dog Man's origin story. He's just this, like, 27-year-old gay man who is um, has an ongoing relationship with his rich hotel owner. Right. But something's gone wrong. What's happened? He's... It wasn't exactly clear. No, it wasn't. Mad. He's mad at Lewis for something. Right, because all of a sudden Horace doesn't have... Sent his keys back to Lewis's apartment. He's... Lewis actually didn't get an uh, official invite to this party. He yeah, just, he did. Did he get an he official? Got, he got something in the mail that said, if you come, dress as a dog. Right. Well, no, he invited himself to the party because Horace didn't originally invite him, but he got the note saying, if you come to this party, dress as a dog. Because you know I love to fuck dogs. It's dog fucking man. Dog fucking man. Dog fucking man. So he does. He dresses as a, as a dog, a big, giant dog. It's adorable. <laughs> But something obviously has gone wrong because he's he's running through the hallway just crying. Right. And it's he he he's thinking about how everyone told him this this boyfriend of his was just this asshole who was involved in the the movie business and he would always want to fuck like the actresses before he he would give them he was basically a Harvey Weinstein. So he's running away, he comes across a man and a woman fucking in the hallway. Right. Which is, you know, that happens in hallways. This this hotel is not available to the public anymore. Not not at, for this particular party. No, because there was a thing where he says the hotel had stood vacant since nineteen thirty six when the last owner had gone broke and shot himself. Right. So it's been ten yields. So it's been vacant for 10 yields, right? Yes. But there, this is a party before they reopen the hotel. I know that. But I mean, until yeah. then, I mean, the hotel hasn't been open to the public. That's true. But who was the last owner? Who shot himself? I don't know. I don't know if it was the brothers or if there was somebody else between there. Yeah, I don't know. We don't get that section. No, we don't. So we have no idea. Yeah. Anyway, so he goes into his room and he's just hiding from all these people. Who are just fucking and sucking the night away. Right. And he's like so upset because he left his sleeping pills at his house. He's like, how am I ever going to get to sleep? I mean, that's your own thought, man. You're dressing as a dog, you know you're going to need some sleeping pills. <laughs> so he finds, uh, he looks into the medical cabinet. And that's when he's like, well, the hotel is still vacant for 10, day- for 10 yields. There's no way there will be anything inside of this medical cabinet. But right. there was a pill, there was a bottle of sleeping pills. Surprise. But she takes and then gets into a bathtub and drowns. Right. But, like, where did these pills come from? Well, and that's just it, because later they're not found anywhere or anything. And but he's like... They're ghost pills. They're ghost pills. Ghost pills. Yes. Do you think those, like, ghost drug dealers? Of course. Probably. I mean, where do they come from? I mean, they've got to come from somewhere. Have to be so there's got to be a ghost pill pusher somewhere. <laughs> Probably. Like, hey! Hey, dog man! I got what you need. Exactly. I got what's going to make you feel good, dog man. <laughs> Is that what Dylan's uh, book's all about that he reads? I sincerely He, he has like eight books called Dog Man, right? Yes. This is him. I don't think so. He's reading books about a... I don't think he's reading books about some okay. sort of okay. porno... Okay, I think so. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the guy, the the guy who does the autopsy, he's like, up. Oh, there's no signs of drugs, and 
He, he, he just can't drown yourself in a bath, bathtub, so there's homicide at play. Right. And he bribes him by just buying dif- different things around town. Right. He buys everything and gives him a raise. He buys, and... like, new police calls, new right. libraries. Library. But it's like, why is this cool? And they'll give a shit about a new library. How does he benefit? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think he just benefits by the fact that the city benefits. I don't I guess, but yeah, then they milk it as a uh, suicide. Right, an accident. that's it. Rather than a murder. Then we get to seeing the fool. Yes. Which is called. And now this word from New Hampshire. And this one's pretty brief. It takes place in 1953, more away from the hotel, but in New Hampshire. We are. And uh, Jack Tullens, called Jackie Tullens, because he's just a child at this point. Do you get it? <sighs> Uh, he is on his pulch reading a comic book when his drunk dad comes stumbling down the road and he's the kid is like, Hey dad, wheels the vehicle and the dad's like, I wrecked it and the kid's like, Oh, that's too bad and the dad's like, I'm gonna kill you now and he chases him through a right. through the neighborhood and he climbs up this tree house and the dad follows and then kicks him off and he breaks his arm. Yep. Which of course is um Directly uh, reflecting off of what will happen in The Shining when Jack Tillens breaks his son's own arm. Right. It's kind of a cool composition. Well, I mean, it just proves that violence begets violence, you know? Yeah. That what was done to him, he will eventually do to his own son. It's kind of sad. It is depressing. On to the last... The last? The The last last scene of... Before the play, it's called The Overlook Hotel, Thor de Flor, 1958, which takes place in 1958. Is that when it takes place? <laughs> A bunch of uh, mafiosas are sneaking up to the presidential suite of the Overlook Hotel. They've been uh, contracted to kill someone who was a big wheel in the a big operation. Wheel. So it's a mafia hit going on right yes. now. Well, the Overlook has gotten this reputation for being kind of like a neutral ground for gangsters. Like they can come, yeah, I don't know, and they can come together and they can play games and stuff. Are they all really just driving sixty miles up this hill? Yes, that's awful. No, I don't know, but it's become like no mafia's in Colorado. That well, that's just it. There's no mafia in Colorado, so they can come together and. So, like, you know... It's a long way to travel to play chess. It is. And they can have drinks together, and they don't fight there, and... Yeah, but, I mean, there's one thing I've learned from any mafia movie with a neutral ground to to like, in uh, Godfather, like, in John Wick. Someone's going to get shot in the face eventually. Of course. It always happens. There's no neutral ground. There's only a neutral ground until somebody gets shot in the face. <laughs> Uh, oh, and during the shootout, in case you will doubting this was written by Stephen King, someone does pee his pants after seeing a ghost. Yes, well, that's important. Yeah, because during this whole shoot, like, every, basically what follows is people shoot each other basically, until yeah. everybody is dead. But, like, black spots keep popping up. Yeah. What's um, going on here? I don't know. This was, like, one of the shorter scenes, and it was just, like, okay. Yeah, know? we could have done without this. You should have ended with uh, the Jack breaking his own arm. Right. That would have been a good way to end the prologue. Um, but that's all of that's all of it. That's right. before the play and like I said, I'm, I'm glad they, they cut it. Right. Because The Shining begins with Jack Tolens being interviewed for the job of kill taking the Overlook Hotel and that's where it should begin. Not this long No, ass. because if you had no idea what the hell The Shining was about, A, you would have been like, what the hell is all this information for? And B, it would have spoiled what The Shining is about. I mean... Yeah, because, I mean... Part of the part of the Shining's excitement, and that's not the word I'm looking yeah, for, it's, charm, is the fact that you have no idea what the hell is going it's on. Like, is this place really haunted? Is Jack Tolens insane? What, right. what is this? But right. no, I mean, this pretty much spells it out. Yeah, that this hotel's haunted. Right. This is why. Which is what you understand by the end of the reading it. Maybe. But... Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe. I, I guess we'll have to decide that on um, the podcast we do of The Shining. Of The Shining. Which will be next week. Yes. Along with maybe an episode on the movie. 
Hopefully. We're going to try. It just depends on how much time we got. We're going to try. Uh, before I end this episode, I will say we will begin doing something new. Over on Patreon, we will begin posting all the show notes we make on each episode exclusively for anyone who pledges three bucks and above. Ooh. So if you want to see all the nonsense we write <laughs> to prepare for each episode... Some of it's not going to make a lot of sense, but we will make it available along with links to um, inflammation, like the um, scan images from the TV guide. Go to... Right. It'll be on www.patreon.com slash Publishing. And if you pledge $3, you'll get this exciting post. We'll pledge a mole, too. I mean, three and above. You could, you could. We have lots of other, other um, pilks available. Just go check them out. Now, uh, on to... I mean, yeah, that's the episode. That was it. Are we going to rank this? No. No, we'll just include it with The Shining yes. itself. And speaking of The Shining, that will be the next episode. I would assume so. Yeah, I mean, it might be coming out this week. It might not be coming out until next week. Either way, stay tuned. Woohoo. It's going to be a long episode, I imagine. I mean, we just did almost an hour on a prologue. Right, and I imagine The Shining... With its nuances, will take us a long time to get through. 20 minute episode. Snap. I'm doing this it. Let's do it right now. Ready? Let's this is the end, okay? Jack Torrance, he chats into here. No, he I fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> He's employed to uh, you just look after a hotel and then some spooky stuff happens and then. He snaps. It's all good. He's, yeah, he snaps. The end. Exactly. And that, I mean, we all know it. Everybody knows the story. The shinning. The shinning. We need to get Andrew on and do an episode on the um, the shining penalty of the Simpsons. When he gets to that point, we might have, we have like have a cross episode there. Dude. That's um, Andrew Hillbolt, who does a podcast with me called We Shot Mr. Bones, which <gasps> is all about the Simpsons. A little crass promotion. Oh. Anyway, yeah, that was We Feel the Play next week. The Shining. Stay tuned if you want to. Follow along, subscribe to our newsletter at pmmpnews.com. We have a website, castlerockcast.com. Very exciting. Review us, rate us on iTunes and all those other places you listen to podcasts. Uh, is that it? Yeah. Um, like we said, pledge to us on Patreon. Three bets or more gets you all the show notes. Patreon.com slash pmmpublishing. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's it. All right. Have a great one.